On today's Join Us in France, a fun-filled episode where Elise comes on the show to tell us about table manners in France and where those lovely table implements came from. The French tip of the week comes from a listener question, and my husband David geeks out about the differences he noticed between table manners in France and in the U.S. If this podcast is helpful to you and you'd like to show us your support, make your Amazon purchases through Join Us. It doesn't cost you a penny more, and we make a small commission. Go to joinusinfrance.com forward slash support, or click on the picture on the left-hand side of the website. Right now, it's a Père Noël because of the holidays, but I'll change the photo just to keep it interesting. Merci beaucoup. Shout out today to the many listeners who gave us very positive feedback on episode 92 on making sense of terror attacks in France. Thank you very much, everyone who reached out. Your thoughts and prayers are very much appreciated. This is Jonas and Friends, episode 93. Whew. Whoa. We're getting old, woman. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Don't tell me. I know. So, hello. I'm Annie. And I'm Elise. And Join Us in France is a travel podcast about all things French. All things French. A lot of travel. But today, I don't think it's going to be a travel one. No. Not quite. No. <laughs> yeah, you sent me an article and I read it and I was like, what? I bet you didn't know all those things. I did not know those things. Oh, I knew most of them already. But when I, but when I mentioned it to my husband, he was like, oh, of course, of course. Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Well, they don't know what we're talking about yet. No, they don't. <laughs> we like to keep it mysterious. <laughs> but before we get to that, do you want to say something about, I mean, last week's episode was all about the terrible events of November the 13th. We're recording ahead, we're recording ahead. The, the, you know, f for to be released in 10 days, but we're a few days after November the 13th. Do you want to yeah, have something you want to Just, I guess, well, I don't think I want to go into it in depth. And, and you are doing the whole, po you know, you have the whole podcast where you're really dealing with people who are much more expert about it. But mm -hmm. I guess just, uh, just as a personal kind of thing to say that obviously it's something that is very disturbing. Uh, I'm very uh, proud, I guess, of the attitude of people in France, particularly in Paris, who really have the same kind of attitude I think that uh, English people and Londoners must have had uh, during World War II, which is, uh, you know, that uh, we're not going to be defeated or intimidated, even though to be extremely honest, obviously there's a certain scary element and yeah. a creepy element in all of this because we're dealing with a nebulous, invisible kind of situation where you yeah. never know uh, what's going to happen at a given time. And I think that it would be uh, totally dishonest to say that it is not on everybody's minds. Yeah. It is on it everybody's is. minds. It is. Very much. Uh, so I think that it's, uh, it's hard, and I think it will take two or three weeks before people – truly are able to just go back to sort of doing a, a normal life without thinking about it too much. Yeah. But unfortunately, it means that this is going to stay in people's uh, psyche. Mm -hmm. And I think we're all going to be living with this for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the roots of all of these problems are extremely complicated, yeah, complicated. very complicated, which doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> just a, a quick comment, because I'm sure that most of the people listening to this will be either over in the States or maybe even in Australia or places like that. Mm -hmm. And I heard somebody on one of the news stations last night uh, making a comment about the fact that he'd, he's somebody, I don't remember who it was exactly, I, he, who had been in Washington two weeks ago for a conference on uh, security mm -hmm. and uh, terrorism. And he said that uh, an American colleague had said something that I think people, especially in the States, really think need to think about, which is that 
Uh, the United States is a country that has the ability, a lot more than France, to simply uh, check who's arriving because you have two oceans on two sides and you don't have that many countries, north and south. Yeah. And there's an enormous amount of checking and security because of the way people arrive in the country. Yep. And that uh, France, because of uh, being part of Europe and being part of a very large organization, which is basically the European community, and because of an attitude which is a good attitude, which is the idea of being open sure. in a lot of ways, uh, has unfortunately lent itself uh, to, to being in a, a more fragile situation than, yeah. than the United States. Yeah. And we are, uh, well, you we have are much to smaller. You, you know? have to imagine... Uh, Something similar uh, would be if you had a million, like we have a lot of Syrians fleeing right. th all this terrible, f f they're fleeing the same people. Right, exactly. You know? Exactly. And, and they are coming to Europe. There's about a million of them. Well, imagine if you had a million people on the southern border wanting to come in and to top it all off, they don't speak the same language. They don't have the same religion. Right. It's really complicated. It's very complicated. It's really, really complicated. It's very so. complicated. And, of course, it is also complicated because if you have one person or two out of a million who comes with bad intentions, right? Uh, uh, you, you really don't know how to separate those tiny percentages out from yeah. the mass of people who and really it, are seeking refuge. Exactly. You know? Most, the vast majority of Muslims want they don't want to hurt us. They just want to live their lives. That's right. The and they're the ones that are getting majority. bombed over there as well. Exactly. You know? Exactly. So it's, it's, it's hard. Yeah, it's a very hard situation. And But at the same time, you have to remember that France welcomed half a million Spaniards. Um, In 39. Yes. At the, at it, right before the Second World War. Uh, so it, we have the ability... To integrate a lot of people at once, do we still have that same ability today? I don't know. I don't know. And and Spaniards, of course, we're not. It's not the same I culturally. I know. Culturally, what you mean. it's very different. It's very different. Right? However, it is also true. And and I was discussing with my husband the other night this. The, the there were many Spaniards that were put in prison and and camps because mm -hmm. the French government was afraid that they were going to start organizations to fight against Franco and what was going on in Spain from here, here that's and right. they didn't want it destabilizing the country. So there was a kind of uh, attitude that even though they were European, they mm -hmm. weren't necessarily all as welcome as you might think. Yeah. And uh, even prior to that, apparently at the beginning of the 20th century, very poor Italians from southern Italy came across the border and there were riots because nobody wanted yeah. these foreigners here. So yeah. it, it's very hard to not Anytime you get have confused a, with all right, this. Right, a you big know? population pressure, it's hard. It's, it's hard, hard on anybody. And just, just transpose it to your own country. And imagine if this was happening right. to your own country and it might help you more visualize more right. what we're saying. It's not that we want to be heartless. It's just that it's super complicated. It's super complicated. But yeah. at the same time, I think that it's really important for uh, people to, I was listening to one of my favorite classical radio stations this morning, and uh, every morning uh, from from seven to nine, they have a guest musician or singer, and this time it was a jazz singer, and he said, uh, "There shouldn't be canceling of concerts." You know, yeah. it turns out that Monday night the Philharmonic was super packed uh, in Paris. Yes. Uh, and I think that's wonderful, you know, yeah. and I think it's, that's what we have to do. You know, we just yeah. have to keep doing what we do. Yeah. Um, so do you think people is going to, I mean, should they be canceling their trips you know, to Paris? Is the question. I, I don't think they should, but at the same time, who am I to say? I, exactly. I mean, I mean it, uh, there are certain places in the world I don't want to go right now because I don't want to be in a place where I think there's a high level of risk. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's true in Paris. Yeah. But there is a reality to what just happened. So I think that uh, if people feel that they're going to be comfortable, and uh, I think, you know, 
a lot of people say, unfortunately, in a very ironic way, that the several weeks after an event like this are the safest because there's so yeah. much security everywhere, you know? I mean, yeah. everything is controlled. Police I, is on the offense It's right on now. the offense. And, so and these there's guys are on the run. Absolutely everywhere. Yeah. They were just talking about the fact that the Philharmonic, this is just one example, the Philharmonic in Paris, which is a brand new hall on yep. top of everything else. Yeah, just north of Paris. They just installed metal detectors at all the doorways in and out of the concert hall. Yeah. Well, it's reassuring. I may have cost them so much, yeah. some money, but they've already had that in the museums for several years. Yes. So, of course, it makes sense to me that they would do that in a place like a venue like the, the yeah. Philharmonic. To go up the Eiffel Tower, you go through a metal detector. You go through a metal detector. So, already. okay. So, you go into Notre Dame. Th this, is the, this is what we do, you know. I mean, you, you yeah. take certain measures and then... Whatever, you know. Yeah. I, I think that... Uh, Where it's going to be tricky is going to be train stations. Yeah. Because for now, there is there are some spot checks at train stations. But how do you control but 20 a metro train lines? train station you know, is like and, a, and train a, a beehive right. of activity. That's going to be tricky. And it's they have hard. to do something. They're going to have to do something. something. But I don't know what it is. Yeah. The Spaniards have figured yeah, it out. they have a control for the so, TGV. Yeah. Well... You know, I, this is what I think. I think that if people feel very uncomfortable, they should not cancel. They should just postpone if they can. Right. Make it a little bit later. Yeah. And besides, I mean, November through February is really not ideal to come to France. Unless you want to spend all your time looking at art in the museums. Yeah. Because yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. what it's the best. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But, but really, it's, you know, uh, there are people who say, this is fine. It's not going to, you know, affect me. And then there are those, I think you shouldn't do something that's going to make you feel very uncomfortable. Right. So I heard uh, people talk about, discuss this on French radio, and they were saying that 10% of trips uh, that were supposed to come take place right now were canceled. Were canceled. And another 30% were postponed. Well. So, you know. That's not too bad. That's not so bad. No. And there will always be people wanting to come to Paris. That's right. really not an issue. So, yeah, it, it's going to change a few things. But personally, if I had my tickets, but well, I have my tickets booked to go to You'll the go U.S. Right. Uh, for Christmas and New Year, and I'm not canceling that. No. Even though I might get gunned down at some university, and we're going to go to university exactly. with my daughter, you know, because she wants to go to college in America. Well, you've hit, a, you've hit a sensitive <laughs> spot there. I mean, this is even what somebody in my family said to me on the phone the other day. It's like, quite honestly, there are more people killed that way in the States than what we have going on here, you know? Yeah, I mean, if you so. just count bodies, I'm afraid, yeah. you know? So, but... Just, and you can get killed crossing the street. Yes. But that's, I guess the difference is... That there's this idea and this sense that uh, this is planned and there's a sense of being targeted in some way. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, life is strange, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So you just have to, you have to put up with it. If you, if you feel comfortable doing it, come. If not, then postpone. It's, you know, it's whatever makes you feel it was, I comfortable. Think that's, yeah. Whatever yeah. makes you feel comfortable. Yeah. Because you want, you want to come here to have a good time. You don't want to come here to, you know, like, <gasps> this no. person going to attack me. You know, that, that would be a terrible vacation. That's about the worst vacation ever. So. No. Yeah. There you go. There we go. All right. So shall we get back to our weird subject? That's all your fault. <laughs> it's all my fault. <laughs> that, I knew, that I knew nothing about. Okay. Should I tell you what gave me the idea? Yes. Yes, please. Okay. I was, uh, now I don't even remember if it was on television or one of my uh, incessant looking of, on internet at something. I mean, ever since I got my smartphone, I feel like it's become attached to my body. I think they're just going <laughs> to put it under my skin and I don't have to do anything about it. You have to know that anymore. Elise resisted the smartphone <laughs> for years. For years. And then she got one and now she's like I a sleep teenager. With it under my pillow. She's no, a teenager. I'm she's a gone teenager. crazy. I've actually gone crazy. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, there was some of this that, and obviously nobody has any idea what we're talking about. But some of this I already knew, but there, there was a mention. There was they were talking about wine, and at some point, uh, somebody mentioned the fact that the clear, long stem wine glass, as opposed to uh, a shorter, stockier form, yeah, is actually the form, aside from its decorative elements. Uh, was used 
uh, when they started making a lot of glass, which of course has to do with the history also of how glass was very expensive at first. Right. But it was specifically used starting in the Middle Ages as a way of being able to detect poison. Poison? That's right. How would it help you? Well, because you have to imagine that up through into uh, the 16th century, glass was an extremely rare and expensive thing. Yeah. And so it was largely used for the princely class. You're right. And the main... Everybody else drank out of pewter. They drank out of pewter. Or or some sort of... Or brass. Right, exactly. Yeah, like... Right? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, And of course, and the principal way of getting rid of an enemy all for centuries and centuries and centuries, starting with the Greeks, was not stabbing. It was poison. But let's not be paranoid or anything. (laughs) And so uh, they said, and I'll tell you uh, afterwards, because I was reading one of the things that had to do with the the change, the history of the changes of the form and everything, and even the history of Chin Chin, which is fascinating. Anyway. Chin Chin, like when you chink glasses? So, um, So I went, whoa. That would be really a fun subject for a podcast is talking about the evolution of uh, the forks and knives and the things we use, the utensils we use for eating and the glasses we use for drinking. And a part of it, of course, is technological evolution. Part of it is based on history and sociology. So that was what gave me the idea. Well, that was a fabulous idea because I think it's going to be interesting. So, so now you have to tell. You have to tell. Okay. So how do we go? This is this is. Oh, the, oh, oh! Before what, we what? go, the difference between a park and a garden. Oh, please, okay. please, right. let's not forget okay. that. To, can, can, is everybody out there following us? We we have very <laughs> weird brains, you know. We we've just okay. covered four different subjects on, in the last on episode. <laughs> On episode, what, which one was it? The, 76, you said. 76. It was the Parks and Gardens in Toulouse. Mm. Elise mentioned, like, one of the off remarks that she's going to get to, but sometimes she doesn't, <laughs> uh, that there's a big difference between Parks and Gardens. Well, that there's a difference there's between a difference. Parks and Gardens. And there's this gentleman, I assume it's a gentleman, I don't know, this person has been asking. Okay. And I forget to. I, I okay. Forget it. Basically, a garden is inside a park. Okay. Oh. So what you have is, what is the difference? Uh, and this is, of course, historically. Uh, we're not talking about nomenclature, perhaps in different parts of the states or in places where there's a kind of indiscriminate use of, of the two. A garden is a planned use of plants. Okay. Uh, and plants can also include trees, like in a botanical garden, but it is uh, extremely planned and you it have has a purpose. To, for it has it. a purpose and it has a purpose in terms of the the actual it's either decorative or yep. it can be uh um an herbal garden uh and a park from its inception way before parks became public green space a park was basically the equivalent of a large estate i see and a garden is a part of what goes on inside that space so my in my perfect life i have this castle with a big park around it and part of that is a garden is a garden that's right okay okay for instance in fact here in toulouse the perfect example is the Japanese garden inside Compans Caffarelli Park. Correct. That's for that. Because yeah. you have a formal Japanese Zen garden yeah. planned out in very formal and rigorous ways. Yes. Inside a space that is, I think, nine hectare or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's a big It's 20-something acres or 25 acres. I don't even remember. But it's a space that obviously has uh, grass and trees and, and, yeah. and artificial little you know, baby hills and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. But the park itself is the big space. If you go to Florence, Italy, mm-hmm. you have the formal gardens, the Bobelli Gardens, yep. that are behind the big palace, and the rest of it is the park. Excellent. Okay. Now we know. Now we know. You weren't making that up. No. I wasn't making that up. I don't make things up too often. Sometimes <laughs> I do, but it doesn't work too well. I'm, I'm not good at ad-libbing things. Except jokes every once in a while. See, I make her laugh. That's the fun part. Okay. So the topic yes. for today is... And I apologize forks for knife, that. Forks, knives, spoons, and, 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 and whatever glasses. Whatever else pops into my mind. And, and, and what, what is... And, the, and eventually, of course, uh, it, the, one of the other things that made me think of, 
about this subject after listening to this thing, which I thought was a lot of fun about, you know, I'm really into medieval mysteries and all of that. So it is true that poison was considered to be the major way of getting rid of uh, somebody in, mm-hmm. in, all through really centuries and centuries. But then the other thing was that I have not very often, but a couple of times been invited to a French person's home where I really wasn't sure what all the utensils on the table were for. I see. And um, Somebody fancy, obviously. Somebody fancy, exactly. Somebody fancy. Mm-hmm. And in fact, now this may be just because I grew up in a family that was largely uncultivated in that way, <laughs> which is very possible. Uh, until I came so to I. France, <laughs> I never saw uh, and people out there. Some people would go, oh, my God, she really does come from one of those uncultivated families. I had never seen a special... Fork for fish. Ah, well, we had that growing up in my family. See? Yes, we but had But I had seen four... Um, now, no, I'm they... sorry. No, I had never... I had seen a fork. I had seen an oyster for, fork. I had never seen a knife for fish. That's what I had never ah, seen before. Yeah. And I, the first time I saw one, and this is probably why, because, you know, you always get traumatized when you, you make a gaffe somewhere. Uh, the, the, the French fish knife looked to me like a butter knife in the United States. Yes, it's a little wider. It's And it's shorter. And I made a mistake. Ooh. And, oh, boy, do you never forget things like that afterwards, you know? It's like, <laughs> oh. Did somebody point it out to you? Yeah. Oh, that's not nice. Well, even if it wasn't necessarily with enormous hostility, it was kind of like, oh, God, you're such a stupid American, you know? It's like, <laughs> don't you know what it's that is? It's true that when know? an American makes that mistake, <clears throat> you probably would point it out just because it's funny that an American makes that mistake. But right. if a fellow French person makes that mistake, you probably wouldn't say anything. No. you would you, Either that yeah. or you'd give them one of these nasty looks, you know. It's like, you know, <laughs> just like that. And, and, then, and, then there were some, and then there were some other things that I find are curious but that are still in usage today. For instance, uh, a French soup spoon is gigantic. Yes. You have to have a huge mouth. <laughs> It's almost like a serving, it's a serving spoon. spoon. Yeah. You know? And I've never quite understood why. Uh, we be- have lots of different sizes of spoons. You have we? lots of different sizes of spoons. So between that and the idea that uh, I loved the idea that the stem on a piece of glass stemware was originally designed. In fact, what they explained was that uh, the, the servant or the server I, uh, would uh, serve the Lord, in this case, obviously, it comes from a time when that was what was what was going on, uh, holding the stem and not having the fingers on the actual uh, cup part of the, the glass. I see. So that uh, uh, when the wine was poured in, it, they could not suddenly flip something inside it. That was the whole idea. Wow. And it really comes from this paranoia uh, that yeah. that goes back so far between <laughs> rivals. Maybe they were right. I, Maybe, I mean, just think about it. You know, so many kings and princes and, and all dukes and people trying to make it to the throne uh, wind up getting killed. And a lot of times it was by surreptitiously putting some poison in the <laughs> things, you know. So apparently... Um, What's interesting is that, of course, at the very, very beginning, the very beginning, very beginning, as far as we know in the Western world, it was, as you say, the equivalent of what is called a tankard. That is, it was either a, a cup made out of uh, a leaded metal substance or uh, like that must pewter. Have been good for their brains. Or ceramics. Yeah. Uh, and it really wasn't uh, glass. Uh, that That's another thing. But, of course, it's a sort of a separate, separate subject in a sense, but I love it. Uh, you know, glass was really used uh, officially for the first time in ancient Egypt, uh, mm-hmm. as far as we know. Uh, maybe in China also. I have no idea. But the first evidence of the use of glass goes back to about 2000 BC, mm. uh, long which is a fairly long time ago. Yeah. And one of the reasons, maybe I'm off by a few hundred years, but it, it was at least 2000 BC. Um, but one of the reasons is because it's, uh, you know, a silicate, it's made with uh, sand and, and silicates, and it requires an enormously high temperature. Mm-hmm. And that is one of the reasons why the first glass was never transparent and clear, because it's um, it's imp- it was impossible for them to make the temperature so high to get the, all the impurities out. I and see. in fact, it's the impurities make that lovely kind of pale sea blue green 
color mm, that mm. you see in ancient Egyptian and even uh, early Roman glass. Mm -hmm. And the Romans mm -hmm. took the technology from the Egyptians and it was used for a very long time as a very scarce, very rare and expensive commodity because it was so difficult to make. So it was really for the few privileged few. Hmm. And so obviously for centuries and centuries, and of course we know that the Romans drank uh, spiced, diluted wine as a general beverage all day long. That was the yeah. basic beverage. And one of the reasons apparently is because they knew that plain water was toxic. I mean, there were, you know, yeah. microbes and things and whatever. They didn't know what that was, but, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> but they, they, they really... Uh, wine all day long is not so good either. No, but it was really <laughs> diluted and it was spiced, you know. In mm -hmm. fact, it was probably the kind of thing that most people would find disgusting to drink today because it even had honey <laughs> in it and stuff like that. Yeah. You know? So... But poison, aside from the occasional U2 Brutus type of, you know, stabbing, mm -hmm. was really um, uh, the, the killing of preference, if you want, yeah, yeah, yeah. among those who were fighting for power. Well, watch out uh, what you eat and drink. Exactly. And, uh, and then, of course, we, we get all the way into the Middle Ages where the source of the manufacture of all glass... Wait, wait, wait. You didn't serve me my tea in a... In a glass, you touched it. You might have oh. flicked something in there. <laughs> God, she is paranoid today. I was like, hey, "Well, I'm here. almost done drinking it." Oh, there you go. go. Go, go, rinse out the cup and take another one. You know, use it. Use another tea bag. You know, I'll give you another tea bag. Yeah. Actually, I never thought about you could poison tea. That's Agatha Christie, I guess. We have to go. Yeah, find yeah, it. yeah, Agatha yeah. Christie, yeah. <laughs> but it was, of course, uh, thanks to the Venetians that glass starts to be made on a somewhat larger scale. Mm -hmm. uh, and they became the major producers of glass for several centuries for the entire Western world. And glass became something in terms of the actual form of stemware started with the Venetians. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about 800 years ago, really. Okay. Uh, and, and it became very decorative at the same time more and more with these very long stems. Right. The, the more they developed the technology, uh, the, the more they were able to create these beautiful pieces with these very long stems. And one of the reasons why was because there were all, you know, all, every city state in, in that area. And, and of course in France and all these Dukes and everybody everywhere, mm -hmm. they were all trying to get rid of everybody that was, you know, up for the <laughs> throne, you know, it's like have a glass. And so, um, the other thing I found out in reading about all this is that the origin of what we do in France, which is called, uh, when we do a toast, we go chin, chin. Yes. <laughs> chin, chin. Chin, chin. Okay. Which really doesn't mean anything, right? No. Okay. So it turns out that this also goes back to the later in the middle ages. This goes back to the period of like the 1400s. Uh, and it's because... Once people got onto the fact that it was possible uh, to avoid poison by holding onto the stemware, you see, yeah. um, then somebody, some very clever and deceivious, uh, devious uh, types of, type of person uh, decided, well, we could try and see if we can poison somebody in another way. And so apparently, <laughs> this, this, uh, I think this is also fresh fun. Anyway, so what they would do is, um, and this apparently was also, even when it was not stemware, they would take whatever uh, recipient they were using, yeah, whether it was a tankard, you know, or, or a stemware glass, and they would fill it up to the top. To the brim? To the brim. Well, that's a bad and, idea. And then that's they would, an accident <clears throat> waiting to happen. It's an accident waiting to happen if you're using very fragile, very expensive glass. But yeah. obviously, at the time, except for a small amount of the glass, it was it was not that thin and and not quite yeah, okay, that fragile. Okay. And then what they would do, they started saying, "Okay, let's make a toast." Yeah. And the idea was, this is you have to think about how clever these people were and how devious that uh, in in going chin, because the liquid went up to the top. It would spill over into the other glass. Oh, yeah, it would. It would, It indeed. would make a mess, too. It would make a mess. Yes. And it was so you could actually... Oh, add some of your beverage to the other that's person's right. beverage. And oh, you, goodness. Goodness gracious, right? Oh, we don't do it that way anymore. No, we don't. We just clink a little bit 
but we don't we spill. don't like, we yeah, don't that's, spill that's what and, and we don't <laughs> fill up the glass all the way up to the top no, we at don't. all no, we, you don't. Know? we don't but that was the original idea the idea was that you could transfer something <laughs> nasty from one glass to the other to the other really and that Why is the origin chin chin? of chin chin that oh, is really wow. the origin of chin chin that's you know? crazy isn't pants. that crazy i didn't know that isn't that wonderful <laughs> oh my god it's great you know? i like that and now of course what we do is we barely touch the glasses and barely nobody's other liquid gets into <laughs> our glass there's you know? no mixing of liquids in this <clears throat> country uh, 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 no, uh, uh, uh. you don't do that and no. besides in france it's actually bad form to fill the glass too much yes so we we usually use smaller glass wine glasses for everyday use That's i mean right. you, we probably have fancy glasses for special events that are bigger but like i go to america and they serve you a glass of wine and the glass is so huge you think, oh, I've only had two glasses. I'm fine. And then, That's boom, right. You boom. Yeah. And of course it is. <laughs> because they're huge. They're huge. And yeah. even if you only fill them up halfway, it's still huge. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, it's true terrible. that it's, in France, very bad form to put in more than a minute, most a half of a glass. Yeah, you do a half to maybe a little bit more than a half, but you don't you fill don't it fill up. You don't fill it up. Yeah. And, and not only that, but of course we have the different size glasses. Right. My The glasses I use every day at home are 19 centiliters. I know this because I replaced some recently. Yeah. And so that's like a can of Coke is 33 cent centiliters. Oh boy. So it's a half then. So it's, mm, yeah, well, a quite. little more than half. A little, a little bit more than half. But it's, you know, the, and that's if you fill it up to the top. Right. Which obviously you don't. Right. So you probably put at most 15 centiliters right. in your, in your glass. So anyway. It's, it, that's just what we do. We don't right. fill it up. And that, all. of course, is part of the whole etiquette. But it's also true that the reason now we don't fill things up is so that we don't do this over, spilling over chin chin. It's true that in movies, you often see people like banging that's glasses right. of beer together and it's like, boom, it <coughs> floats in the air yeah. and it's crazy. So, but could you imagine that that is really the origin of this? It's like, wow. okay, I'm going to see if I can get it in there somehow. You know? <laughs> I was like, all right. You know, like, go ahead, drink up. It's really nice. You know, hey, Annie, don't you want a piece of my cake? <laughs> <laughs> I will. But now she's going to be worried. It looks harmless enough. <laughs> <laughs> looks harmless. Hey. Everything that's real dangerous could look harmless. You know, you never know. You know, so that is the, it's. I think it's really fascinating because what happened then was once we once in, in in history, and of course in this case we're talking about really Western European history. Uh, the Americans picked all this up starting only in the 19th century. Anyway, in terms of all yeah. of this, uh, once uh, it got past the the. Uh, period of time in history where people really were that worried about just getting poisoned, uh, what happened was, and this is largely because of the suite of, you know, Louis the 14th and all of that, mm -hmm. the, aside from the fact that of course he had official tasters and, and all of the Kings always had official tasters, but then what developed was out of all of this developed the ritual of etiquette so that you had to have everything very formalized. And I guess one of the reasons for that is that it was a way also of controlling uh, if you could really standardize and say, okay, uh, this has this this liquid has to be in this kind of glass. This has to be this. It was also a way of controlling things yeah. a little bit more, making sure that everything was yeah was, yeah. was okay. Yeah. Um, and and so I find that just fascinating. And then we get to the uh, table utensils. Right, which which are kind of complicated. Like my okay, so my parents have now both passed away, and so we had to s split up the inheritance, you know, the stuff. And my mother had this really fancy uh, piece of. I mean, it was like a, a small table with drawers that had all this really fancy flatware, silverware, yeah. flatware stuff. And I think it went to my brothers. I'm pretty sure. But it had things for like escargot, little, mm -hmm. almost toothpick looking right. things with, with two little, a tiny fork for escargot, which we never eat that. I don't think I've used those in my life. Uh, there were things for uh, the fish spoon and the fish knife. There were all sorts of things that I, if you asked me to set the table today using no, all those, I wouldn't know how to you do it. You wouldn't know how to use them, right? No, I would have to look it up. I mean... I would know that you're supposed to look it up right. first. <laughs> right, exactly. You know, I know that right. much, but that's it. <laughs> well, it's interesting because I remember growing up with the idea of 
there being two kinds of forks, a salad fork, which is shorter uh, than the main dish fork. Yeah. And in my family, that was pretty much it. There was the yeah. salad fork. Then there was, of course, the soup spoon and then the table, uh, the teaspoon. Yeah. Uh, and uh, again, the the size and the form of them, even even a regular uh, fork for uh, what we would call the main dish fork in Europe, the prongs are much longer than in a uh, flatware design in the United States. It's huh. very interesting. They're, they're shaped differently. But it is true that there are uh, many, many, many different kinds of, of forks. In lives, there are perhaps fewer in the style and, uh, and function, if you want to call it that. But mm-hmm. what is, of course, true, and I had known this before, but I went back and did some more reading. That's why I gave you that article, yeah. is that the French, like the English, were relatively uncivilized, <laughs> in spite of what? what they, in <laughs> spite of what they like to think, and uh, uh, they basically used a spoon and a knife, and uh, that was for a long, long, long time. And it was the Italians, <laughs> of course, and specifically Catherine de Medici, who, uh, at the age of fourteen, uh, was married off to the young Dauphin, who was going to become king, and that is the man who became Henry the Second, and that mm-hmm. is at the very, very beginning of the fifteen hundreds. Yeah. And uh, she was, of course, the daughter of the great uh, Duke of Medici, uh, ruler of the city-state of Florence, which was the probably epitome of sophistication and culture at that point in Western Europe. And what had they already learned to use uh, in Florence, like in the Venetian area, which mm-hmm. is not that far away, uh, but many kinds of utensils and many kinds of uh, foods that the French had never seen. Oh, my <laughs> God. You know, And the French were still into spearing things, uh, putting slices of meat uh, that were mostly roasts on a slice of dried bread, which was used mostly as a plate unless you were a part of the aristocracy. Oh, and, they used bread as their plate? Yeah, they used a, a huge slab of uh dried older bread as a plate if you were really not someone that with not that was wealthy good. and no uh if th- there's even or there used to be a restaurant in Languedoc, southeast of carcassonne that served meals that were like that where you got your food on a slab that was a piece of bread <laughs> It wasn't the most appetizing thing in the world, really, you know. Yeah, like, no, it I, really wasn't, mm, you know. I, don't I mean, think that, no. it's what we call a tartine today, but it was not quite the same That's thing. That's true. You know? Yeah, today at restaurants they will do often that. do tartine, which is a big, a big like a nice, bruschetta, right? Or a bruschetta, but a big piece, right? And they put fancy things on there, right. and it's pretty nice, and it's a whole meal. It's I a mean, whole it's, meal. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a big thing. So it's kind of weird, but anyway. So apparently, um, but it's she, not. Dry, Catherine the Medici came with her entourage, which yep, was all Italian, yep. and she had been warned uh, that she was going to be married off to somebody who, you know, the French were very powerful uh, as, as a kingdom, but they were a bit backwards in terms of sophistication and, and etiquette. Oh, you don't have to say that over and over again. <laughs> and so what, what did she bring with her? Well, she brought forks. Mm, mm, forks. Forks. Mm. Actual table forks. Uh, okay, that, when you come to France, you don't have to do that. <laughs> we have forks by now. She brought forks that were made of silver. Yeah. And uh, at that time, uh, the fork had actually been developed as a personal eating tool a long time before that in Persia, of all places. This is mm. part of the fun that I'm doing the research. And it literally went from Persia to uh, southeastern uh, Europe. And then, of course, uh, with, with all of the commerce and trade, uh, wound up being used by the Romans. But apparently it hit Romans. Italy before it hit France. It hit Italy <laughs> way before it hit France. So, and, uh, but I mean, and if you have a knife and a spoon, you're okay, right? You're, you're not okay. going to starve. You're okay. And, of course, apparently I what happened manage. was, this is what I like. <laughs> So she comes because at that time you had your own personal fork and knife and spoon that you traveled with. I see. So you took it. There was a wonderful like the Girl little, Scouts. It was like a little case <laughs> and you, you took it wherever you went. So, mm-hmm. uh, you, you didn't use, uh, there weren't many, you didn't have many, you had one or two. And so she came with her magnificent, uh, probably initialed, um, silverware and introduced it to the court wow. and there was a there was a monk leave it to them uh who wrote a scathing article about the introduction uh the introduction of forks to the court 
in France and said awful. two things. Just One, awful. that the fork was an agent of the devil. <laughs> of course. Of course. Of course. <laughs> Especially since it was introduced by a woman. Oh, even worse. Even worse. Triple and double. to make things even worse, <laughs> if it wasn't just an agent of the devil, if you were a man, it would have been a sign of uh, being effeminate to use a fork. Effeminate, eh? Yes. <laughs> yes. His name was St. Damien, actually. The, the St. Mark. Damien? Yeah. And mm. there's apparently a whole uh, thing you can read on Wikipedia, what he wrote about <laughs> forks. <laughs> about forks. Oh, you know. they're terrible. But it was scandalous. So there was a part of the oh, court that refused to use them. I see. Because it was considered to be something. Uh, oh, you in, have to stand it was in It was insidious <laughs> to use a fork. Okay. <laughs> so um, th- it took a while. Now, it happens that Catherine de' Medici lived 70 years. So she came to France at the age of 14. So she had a long time to introduce various uh, Florentine and uh, Italian things. In, and, and, of course, introduced many things that had to do with art and, and culture. Uh-huh. And uh, by the time she died, the fork was used by everybody. <laughs> But this is what, 50, 56 years later, right? Yeah. And she's already had three of her sons go through being king and dying, probably from doing chin chin, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no one of them actually died oh. or something else. But can you imagine that half the court refused? to even to touch the fork because they said it was an agent of the devil and it was a foreign thing brought in by this foreigner because that's who she was. Well, right? yeah, she was a foreigner, but I mean, come on, it's easier, right? You can, and it you beca- and of course lips. it added to the sophistication of the court. She also introduced something that is much dearer to my heart and that is ice cream. Oh, and that was also used, introduced at the beginning of the 1500s. Very nice. And she introduced all kinds of herbs and vegetables, which the French really were not big on eating, if you can believe that. They really were into meat a lot and yeah. not necessarily into eating things. And the other thing that happened is that she introduced cooking with certain sauces. And at that point, it was really only the uh, beginning of the idea of eating food that was not simply roasted on a spit. And they thought that there would be poison. I mean, everybody had poison on the brain, you know? It's like, well, <laughs> so everybody thought that if they ate something with a sauce, that it, would, it might have something horrible in it. Poison in it. So it took a long time, but she is really responsible for the creation of what we now consider to be the notion of haute cuisine in France. Wow. S- and, and really and truly, and there are documentations of all of the things she introduced, but I think the most well, wonderful is the fork. Yeah. So we get the Renaissance. By yeah. the time we get <clears throat> uh, later on at the end of the 1500s, there's this sense of pride in France about, you know, well, we picked up the Renaissance ideas and, and techniques and style and blah, 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 sure, blah. Sure. And, of course, France being France. And then we get uh, into the 1600s and we eventually get Louis XIV who wants to codify and make rules about everything. I mean, this is the big deal about Versailles. Yeah. And so what happens is this is now what? This is several generations later. And he says, okay. Uh, so this is when you use this fork, and this is when you use this spoon, oh, and I this see. is when you use this glass, and this is a way not only of controlling the politics and everybody, but you control everything about what I you see. do in your life. And what I didn't know was that uh, the fork, though, uh, really didn't change that much until, for whatever reason, the 1700s, mm-hmm. and then... Uh, there was this idea suddenly of design with the fork and, and they went berserk and then they started (laughs) doing what became in the 1800s. Apparently if you and I sat down at a fancy, real fancy table in the 1800s, we would probably have been shamed to death because there would have been five or six forks. Whoa. And every fork was for something something different. different, something different. And you had to know which fork was for what? Well, nowadays in France, they're most likely just going to give you one, maybe two forks. Yeah. We don't do the salad fork. No, thing. you don't. But no. we, there is definitely a snail fork. There's an yes. oyster fork. Right. Uh, there's a fish fork. Yes. Which is a uh, somewhat different shape than a meat fork. Yes. Uh and then, of course, there's the knife, but the knife doesn't vary all that much. And and if you need it, they'll bring it to you. And uh, yes. uh, you know, it's not like they put it on the table when you arrive and you don't know which one to use. They will give you the utensils at a fancy restaurant. Right. 
yeah, that will go with what what you you've ordered, right? So, but if you and I had been invited to, for instance, um, Napoleon the Third's table mm, in the of middle course. of the nineteenth century, of course, uh, there would have been five glasses. There would have oh, been wow. probably at least five forks and three knives, and then, of course, uh, the spoon for dessert would have been either served, uh, put on the table, and typically, of course, oh, very unlike in the United States, uh, across the top of the the plate. Correct. It's Correct. on the, yeah, on, it's, on the it's right side. underneath your right. glasses. Right. Or it would not have been put on the table at all and would have been brought, s- brought with the dessert. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and, and the glasses, of course, you had to know which one was for water, which one for white wine, which one for cordial, right. which one for red wine and all of that. Mm-hmm. And of course this was etiquette. Now, the other thing that goes with this is that one of the other things that Catherine de Medici introduced, which is really interesting, is the idea of serving one dish after the other. Because oh. up until that time, oh, everything was put on the brought. table. Everything was brought Buffet out. Buffet style. Yep. Everything was brought out. You know, mm. it was like the, the, the groan. You know the expression groaning board? Do you know that expression? No. Oh, it's wonderful. You know, you know what a groan is, obviously. You know? Yeah. Uh, you know. Um, well, it, I guess it's an English expression that comes from the time of the kings where the table was so weighted down with all the food that, that it was it, groaning. groaning right? Oh, wow. So up until Catherine de Medici, that's what they used to do. And she said, no, 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 no. You know, first right. you have this and then you have this. And the sweets well, were at like the that. end, right? The, so yeah, of course. really, and I know most French people really don't want to hear this, <laughs> but really it's thanks to the Italians, you know, that, that we and, became civilized. Yeah. And what's interesting is that, right, the, French, that French. the French simply <laughs> like with a lot of other things, you know, uh, I find this very interesting because it's like the French take an idea and carry it further. Mm. So what happens is one of the very first official chef writers of cuisine was uh, Bria Savarin. Mm-hmm. And I don't remember, I, you have to excuse me, I don't remember exactly, if, I think he's the 1600s, but I'm not sure. It may have been the 1700s, I'm not even sure. Mm-hmm. But he was one of the first ones in, in modern, if you want to call him the last 500 years, modern French history, to actually <laughs> note down and document not only how to eat, but what to eat and in what order to eat it. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. And starting to make, you know, recipes and, and things like that. Mm-hmm. Because up until that time, nobody really cared one way right. or the other, you know. So a Frenchy, a fancy French meal today. Yeah. And I'm not talking about a five-star restaurant. I'm talking for a special occasion. Right. Um, at a regular restaurant or in a family situation, you would have your aperitif. Right. Obviously, which is First of all, the the person will have set the table before you arrive. Oh, for sure. Yes? Yes. Always. Always. The table is set before you arrive. Then you will have your aperitif in one part of the house. So it could be in, on the terrace. It could be around the sofas, it, whatever the situation is at your house. And that will have fruit, a few nuts, a few olives, a few, you know, like little... At at, me, at best, tiny little uh, petit four. Yeah, the petit four. Right. Uh, if it's a fancy event, right. you know, but an aperitif can go on for a good hour. Oh, yes. Yes? Okay. Yes. So people will just talk and have a few snacks, whatever, have a few drinks. And then they will tell you, okay, let's go and sit down for the meal. Aperitif is sometimes standing up, as a matter of fact. Not always, but often, which feels kind of strange to me, but that's what we do. And then you will go and sit, and this is where your entree will appear. Nowadays, a fancy, 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 I need to say it right, (laughs) fancy entree, which is not the entree, but the appetizer. Which means, of course... Entree means enter. Enter, yes. So it's the beginning of the meal. Right. Uh, That's very often today will be either foie gras for a festive occasion, or it could be a fancy salad with... um, Sometimes I notice a lot of 
times these days, uh, it can be something with a kind of phyllo dough, you know, a thing inside yes. or like yes. a little bit of goat cheese. I mean, it's interesting. There's yes. a change in the style of what is served as a first course. Mm-hmm, you know? mm-hmm. It can be as- asparagus salad. Or salad with a little shrimp. Yeah, and or avocado. Shrimp thing. Yep. Um, it could be that sort. It's usually fancy looking. Or um, oysters at Christmas time. Exactly. Oysters would be good too. So that's your entree. And then you will have a main dish, which it could be any number of things. Right. Um, that's really uh, so wide, I can't even touch it. And every time you change uh, course, you change wines. You change wines and you, very, and you change dishes. Yes. So your apéro is often going to be... F- f- the typical thing is for women, it's going to be some sort of sweet wine, uh, sweet or a white kier. wine, or a kir, yes, which is a mixture of uh, white wine and a little s- syrup. I mean, yes. it's like creme de cassis or creme de pêche or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it gives it a little sweeter. Yeah. So it's usually something a little sweet for the women. The men, typically, in the South anyway, they have... Uh, Pastis, yeah, pastis for apéro. Then you will start your, whatever you're serving as your ap- entrée, so your appetizer is going to be uh, the, whatever wine is supposed to go with that. And then with your main dish, again, you t- remove the plates. Most people don't have enough utensils to remove all the utensils. If it's at home, you often remove the plate, but you keep your utensils. Right. That's pretty typical. And then there will be a different wine to go with that. <laughs> then there will be possibly a salad at the end of the meal that is served with cheese, but that's disappearing. The salad, you mean as at the end as opposed to at the beginning? Yes. I'm not seeing that very much ever. No, much. no, um, I, uh, no, it tends to be. In, yeah, Just it's more cheese. Cheese, right. cheese is not served with crackers in no. France. It is served with bread, bread and red wine, typically, although there are people who are crazy and do it some other way. <laughs> there are actually now a lot of uh, wine people who say it doesn't matter, you know, you, mm-hmm. whatever it is you like with it. But yeah, right. yeah. Uh, it depends on the cheese, too. Right. And then typically you will wait a long time before you have your dessert. Which is something Americans have a hard time with. Yes. Because they're not used to the idea of big pauses between each dish. There are long pauses. If it's a fancy event, if it's, if it's a Christmas or something of the sort, the meal will take, or if it's a wedding, or if it's a, I went to a bar mitzvah recently and it took four hours. With a sit down meal? Yes. By the time we showed up, to the time when, when they serve dessert, it was four hours. Wow. Okay? So it takes forever. It's, if you're invited to a French wedding, just you're going to be there the whole day. Or a fancy, you know, a, a holiday meal. You know yeah. that that's going to be the same thing. You cannot show up and expect to eat in two hours and be out of there. No. And, and to that's be honest, nowadays that's been reduced to that. But in fact, there are even still some fancy, fancy restaurants where you have entree and then a fish dish and then a meat dish. That's right. There, that's yeah, but that's, really, you know. That's very fancy. That's really fancy. That's very old style. Yes. I, I don't know anybody who no. still does that. But it is true that Or it's, you would have a soup first as well, your entree you'll have a soup and then the thing about soup is that it fills you up you know i mean yeah, it's, yeah. soup is but you're but it's basically you're right it's a first course main dish cheese course absolutely mm-hmm. always and don't skip that no way and then dessert so it's a four dish meal yeah pretty much and basically a wine with each one that's standard um in france and yeah it's a different wine so by the end you're like <laughs> you're ready for a nap but that's why yeah. it takes a long time. But everybody starts leaning over uh, yeah. at the table. And everybody, you know, the longer the meal goes, the more people laugh because, of course, they're all inebriated to various degrees. And Speak for yourself, Annie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm guilty of that. And, um, and the other thing that happens is that French people have a thing about giving you very small water glasses. So if you wanted to drink a lot of water... 
with your meal instead of a lot of wine with your meal. Well, you would have to get served like 20 times because the glass is like a symbol. It's but ridiculous. that's interesting because theoretically the water glass is the biggest one of all. If you took it, if you look at a service of glasses, oh, yeah, but you have the cordial glass, the white wine glass, the red wine glass, and the water glass. I don't even know what a cordial glass is. Um, turn around, and in my buffet, I'm turning around. I'm turning she's turning around. around. Yeah. Next to the little ancient Greek vase is a cordial glass. Up uh, one row up. There you go. Right there. No, down. Right. No. no, one more up. Up. Right next to my I Greek. There. That's a cordial glass. Oh, that's very small. Yeah. Oh, it looks so like a shot glass, but on a stem. It's exactly. So that's okay. for your Porto, for your little sweet thing, your liqueur, uh, okay, things okay. like that. Okay, okay. I have those. Okay. I have yeah. those. But yeah. they're on a, mine are on a short stem. Uh, but, but basically, you know, it, it's interesting that theoretically in a service of wine glasses, now, of course, it's become fashionable and hip to have glasses that either have short stems or almost no stem, just a p a yeah. pie, yeah. just a foot on it. Yeah. You know? But in, in fact, the water glass, true. the water glass should theoretically be the biggest one of all. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's true that in people's homes, they tend to not put down big glasses. No, they don't. It's interesting. They don't, and I that drives me nuts. I have big glasses, and I do it American style, really, even for my family, and they've gotten used to that, and they enjoy that, which means that as people are having aperitif, I will serve ice water in all the glasses that are oh, on yeah, the table. Oh, you serve ice water. And I serve ice water uh -huh. because by and with a lot of ice because by the time we all sit down. It's melted. It's melted for the most part, but the water is still cold. Yeah. Which is what I prefer. Right, right. But in that way, I'm not French at all. I mean, French people would serve you, you know, water right. room temperature. Right. Um, but you can ask for ice. But if you ask for ice at a restaurant, they'll probably so bring you two minuscule little. Yeah, two ice cubes. Right. So <laughs> it's very silly. I The first time I went to a hotel for business uh, when we came back uh, to France. I was very shocked because I, I asked for ice, which is like basics. You know, in America, you can ask for ice and they'll bring you a... I have to tell them to not put ice in my water. Uh, see? Because I don't like ice water. You're more French. Yeah. I find it, unless it's hot, hot, hot summertime, um, yeah. I find it too cold, you know. So this is, for me, it was like... 11 years ago, uh, more or less, and it was a business hotel. There was uh -huh. nobody but business people in there. So they were used to this. And I asked for ice, and I had to ask like five times. And then in the end, they brought me like three little tiny right. Right. ice cubes. And I was like, what the? Yeah, it's it, it's not part of the uh, yeah. way people drink. In yeah, France. no, it's, no. It's, it's it's very strange. But it's changing. It's, it's changing. Well, it's certainly true that... It's loosened up in terms of this rigid etiquette that existed yes. for so long, and and that it is true that it's a big. There's a big difference between being invited to someone's home and being invited to a fancy restaurant. Yes, you know where there's there's certain convention about the, all the flatware and and this mm -hmm. is and that is. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it, it's interesting because at the same time Americans are becoming a little more bit more conscious of that kind of etiquette, uh, the French are going in a little bit the opposite direction yeah. and saying, okay, you know, we don't have to worry about it being this yeah. rigorous all the yeah. time. You there know? are even some restaurants now when you show up speaking English, they will bring you water right away. Hmm. They don't bring you bread. That, that's, a, that's a thing in France. You know in America how you get to your table and they will bring you bread and water. If you're in an Italian restaurant. Yeah, in Ita which is, yeah, yeah, I go to those a lot. And so th that's the normal standard service. In France, they won't do that. No, not until you order. Right. And if you go to a Mexican restaurant in France, they will not bring you chips and salsa. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. No. They just, you know, you get nothing until you've placed your order. Right. But that's true in Italy too, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It is. That's just the, but nowadays when we show up speaking English, sometimes they will bring us water right away. Hmm. Not bread, no chips, no nothing like that. But maybe we'll get br water right yeah. away, which is good. Which, which is, is good. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's interesting. There is, of course, a big difference between uh, the way things are done in a restaurant and the way they're done in people's homes. But I find it very interesting that uh, aside from really informal 
casual restaurants situations, you still, when you go into a nice place, uh, you have this sense of, you know, this is the flatware that's going to be put on the table. If you order something with uh, meat that needs to be cut, obviously they're going to take away whatever is there and they'll give you a knife that's good for cutting meat. Yes. If you have fish, they're going to give you the fish n- fork and the fish knife. Right. Uh, and, and there's a – I always feel – uh, that there's a sense of pride every time, you know, they bring these things to the table, yes, you know, and yes. it shows this etiquette. And the truth is, I've never actually been to a kind of fancy place like that in Italy. I've been to Italy a number of times, but I guess now I have no idea whether that even exists anymore in Italy. Yeah, I don't know either because I don't, yeah, I don't. I mean, it seems to me like Catherine de Medici brought times. it over here and they just kind of went, ah. Okay, you know, <laughs> that's the end of that. I mean, I know there's such a thing as a spaghetti fork, so uh, yeah, maybe. I've, o- I've only been to a really, really fancy French restaurant a few times, like, a, you know, a, f- a four-star restaurant. I have never been. And they are very strange because they will, it's, it's French-style service, so that means that they will bring you the dish, show you the dish, take it back, cut it all up, a certain way, depending on mm. what it is that you've ordered, and bring you some of it in a plate that's not super full. And then if you want some more, they serve you some more. Mm. It's very strange. I don't like it. I think it's it's really awkward to have to ask somebody for everything. You can't serve yourself water. Right. You can't serve... I mean, you do nothing. They all well, that's the kind you. of hovering in a big fancy restaurant. And I really don't. But like but it. I think it's also true that if you go to really a starred restaurant, you're never going to get huge portions of anything. Oh, and one last thing, and this yes. has nothing to do with Catherine de Medici, but it's something I had never seen before I came to France: a knife rest. Oh yeah, the little doggy thing. Yeah, yeah. I never seen. I'd never in my life seen one before. <laughs> and that was another thing. That was the same day that I had to learn to put my hands on the table. I kind of went, what's that? You know, it's like, what am I supposed to do with that? You know? Yeah. It's, it's like, usually, mm. I mean, I don't see it anymore, but it was big when I was a kid. You, when you set the table, you would put your knife on a, usually it was a so, dachshund. A well, little... No, these were nicer, fancy ones, you know, oh, fancy, but, ones. fancy ones. Yeah. yeah. So it's something that you, you, you rest your knife on there so that it's not, um, sorry, uh, so that it's not, it doesn't dirty the napkin, uh, yeah, the tablecloth, the tablecloth. It, it doesn't dirty the table, which is, which is kind of a cool idea, you know? Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. but, but it was yeah. like, I remember thinking, Oh, this is another object I've never seen before in my life. What am I supposed to do with this? You know, it's like. Well, at least we have been gabbing a long time. And we've been talking about nothing but food and eating and sitting at the table. Exactly. And And it's noon and I'm hungry. And you're hungry. Yeah. And I just, uh, this was fun. And I just wanted to remark for anybody out there who cannot see us that we're both wearing horizontal stripes today. (laughs) That's right. We're we're, prisoners. We're prisoners. (laughs) We're prisoners of etiquette. There we are. (laughs) Very nice. Well, thank you very much, Elise. This was fascinating. This was fun, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, it was fun. Good. Everybody have a nice meal out there after all this. Yeah, bon appétit. <laughs> Remember your manners. <laughs> Au revoir. Au revoir. Okay, so in this part of the show, this is where David and I discuss a couple of things that didn't come up when I was talking to Elise, but are quite important. So, David... Right. So one thing I noticed when when Annie said that they were going to be talking about uh, knives and forks and stuff, I said, oh, well, so then you're going to be talking about how uh, French people specifically and kind of Europeans in general, I believe, uh, hold and use the knife and fork differently today. Right. And she looked at me like I was an alien and she had no (laughs) idea what I was talking about. And uh, and so apparently in in all of her years in the U.S., uh, she she never noticed this. So. The big difference is that in the U.S. anyway, especially if you're right-handed, you tend to cut with the knife in your right hand. Um, You have to imagine this. You're eating something, right? Picture it in your head. So you have... Nice, nice, nice steak, something that that needs a good sharp knife, needs, you know, some good work on it to to cut. And so you you put the knife in in your dominant hand, in your right hand. And the fork in the left hand, and the fork is kind of holding the, the, the steak down. The right hand is cutting the steak, uh, which makes sense, your dominant hand. But then in the U.S., generally what you do is you set down the knife and use your dominant hand to pick up the fork to eat the piece of meat that you just cut. 
which is one of the reasons why a lot of people will cut several bites mm -hmm. and then eat them. Yeah, yeah. Because there's this kind of switcheroo. Uh, yeah, which is bizarre. Hand. I never noticed that. But yeah, and you in, do and that. And in like 18 years or something in the U.S., you never noticed that. No, Most people never. This. <laughs> and in France, what people generally do is they're holding their fork with, you know, the, the less dominant hand. So in my case, the, the left hand cut with the right hand. But then you just go ahead and with the left hand eat the piece that you've just cut off. So you generally just cut one piece, eat it directly, cut another piece, eat it directly. Right. Um, and you don't, you don't switch, switch utensils. Right. Yeah. You just leave the fork in the, in the less dominant hand. And, uh, and sometimes some people will even maybe push a little something else, you know, a little piece of meat and then maybe push a little potato on top of it uh, mm -hmm. with the knife and then eat that together, the, the left hand. Right. Now, and if you are right-handed and you're just eating something simple that doesn't need a knife, like you know, a salad or, or whatever, whatever yeah. that, that doesn't need it. People do generally eat with uh, their dominant hand. So in that case, you set down the knife and you're just using the fork or the spoon and, and you're eating. And in that case, another difference is that in the U.S., when you're only eating with one hand, it's polite to put your other hand in your lap. And that's actually considered impolite here. And I've had, I've had uh, people tease me about it and say, ah, 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 la papate which is kind of yes. local <laughs> dialect for, for the paw, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And don't forget to put your hand on the table. And um, now that you did notice. Yes, yes, right. I knew that, yes. Right. And so, so when you're eating with one hand, you, you just put your hand, not your whole arm, not your elbow generally, but, but you leave your hand next to your plate uh, while you're eating with your other uh, hand. And then another thing that's kind of fun is that if you're doing that, you're using a spoon or a fork to get at something that doesn't need to be cut, but that's kind of running away from your utensil a little bit. You know, you're trying to gather up some peas or, or whatever. And, and if it's, you know, you'd be tempted to use a finger of your other hand to, to push it on. And of course, that's not polite in either culture. Yeah. <laughs> but what you would do, you know, so in the U.S., you might use your, your knife or something. Um, and, uh, but if you don't already have your knife, the 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 reflex that that a French person would have would be to pick up a piece of bread yeah. and push it onto the spoon or fork with the bread. Yes. And I remember one time when we were visiting before we lived here, um, and I was trying to do some kind of low carb diet, and so of course I wasn't eating any bread. And your dad was so shocked, and he looked at me, and he was just like, "So you know, well, he offered me some bread, and when I said no, his eyes got huge, and he's like." Well, how the hell do you eat without bread? And he turned to <laughs> other people at the table and, how does he eat without bread? I don't know how to eat without bread. And and I think that part of it was just it would seem unnatural to him not to have some bread. But but literally, he wasn't sure how he'd push stuff onto his fork politely right. without bread. Right, right. Yeah, it's a, it's a big, it's a pretty big difference. And I think the, one of the reasons why neither I or Elise notice the switcheroo with your hands in America is because we're both left-handed. That could be. And so if you're left-handed, you, you will cut. No, I think, I think I, I'm not 100% sure, but I actually think that a left-hander in the U.S. would cut their meat with the knife in the left hand because it's dominant. And then switch. And then, and, and then switch the, you know, set down the knife, switch the fork from the right to the left hand and eat with the left that hand. I think they would still do that. Inefficient. Exactly. <laughs> but, inefficient. Yeah, and so for some reason it's just kind of considered... Proper etiquette, although I don't think it's something that, that most people worry about. But like if right. you were preparing for some debutante ball or something like that, you know, something <laughs> big and, and, and formal, then they might say make sure that you, you know. But like I said, and that's why Americans will often cut multiple pieces mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then switch and eat. Um, yeah, that's just a fun difference. I mean, it's yeah, not it's anything not a to big worry deal. about. And, yeah. plenty, and, and obviously, you know, because you and Elise never noticed it. You know, you, you going there or here coming here, it's not a huge deal. Most people don't stare at each other when they eat. And, no, uh, no, 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 uh, nothing you know, like that. Ask what's going on or, 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 or criticize or worry or talk about it behind your back or anything. I mean, it's not a big deal. But that is generally the way it's done. I like it. The very first time when I was a teenager, the first time I was in Europe uh, and I found out about that, I was like, I like this. And I've eaten like that ever since. <laughs> One other difference in, in, in France specifically, and this is true in a lot of Western Europe at least, also, is that the bread when you're eating it stays on the tablecloth or on the table, mm -hmm. not on your not on your plate? Yeah, and they don't give you a bread plate typically. 
I mean, a few places, if you if it's a fancy meal, they might give you a separate plate where you can keep your bread. That's rare. Yeah, but I agree. That's unusual. But there will just be a basket that will get passed around, and then people will take a piece or two and just kind of set it next to their plate. Yeah. Um, and uh, and that always felt very strange to me. At, you know, it took me a while to get used to that because it felt... You wanted to put it on the plate. Yeah, it's like... Uh, it's, but it's not like it's a faux pas to put it on the plate. I mean, you put right, it on but the most plate, people, no But most people don't. Most, most people don't. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay, now so you're anyway. prepared for all sorts of eating <laughs> and drinking <laughs> and not get poisoned and all of that. So. Oh, and did you say the other thing that to this day, even after 10 years, still feels a little weird to me is that French people always eat their dessert, no matter what their dessert is, with a spoon. Oh, that's true. No, we didn't mention that uh-huh. in the episode, I don't think. Yeah, if, even if it, I mean, because like if it's ice cream, sure, I get it, yogurt, whatever, but cake? Uh, yes, we don't eat it with a fork, we eat it with a spoon. Right, and, 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 that, yep. and that feels inefficient to me because, you know, yeah, I mean, a cake, <laughs> you can cut it with a spoon as easily as you can cut it with a fork. You don't generally need a knife. You know, if you need a knife to cut a cake, it's a bad, bad cake. <laughs> um, but uh, if you, uh, you know, you, you cut a little piece with your spoon, then sometimes it can be a little tricky to scoop that piece up into the spoon to eat it. And at that point, you probably don't have bread to push it onto the spoon no, with. No, they don't <laughs> serve bread with no, dessert. Not, no, 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 no. And and so for that, I do find it more efficient to, like, you know, cut it with the fork and then just stab it with the fork. And He's a know, stabber. Watch I'm out, a, world. I'm a, I'm a cake stabber. <laughs> Cakes of the world, beware. <laughs> All right. Even with the spoon, you're going to eat it anyway, so I don't know that the cake really cares either way. Suffers one way or the other. Yep. yep. All right. Well, thank you very much, David. You're very welcome. All right. Bye. Bye. This is the French Tip of the Week. Hi, Annie and Elise. It's Suzanne from Winnipeg, Manitoba. Firstly, I want to pass on my condolences to you and everyone in the country of France for the terrible tragedies that occurred this past week. That said, I am still planning to go to France on Saturday, my fly into Paris with my friend Tracy, and we are coming to enjoy France as best we can, and we won't let fear keep us away. We plan on one week in Paris and one week in Strasbourg to enjoy the Christmas markets. My question is, how do I express my condolences en français? Is it appropriate to say something like, je suis désolé for the loss? Um, If you could maybe point me in the right, right direction as far as an appropriate expression or something to say, um, I would appreciate that very much. Thank you. And I look forward to listening to the podcasts while we're in France. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Susan. I am glad you didn't let fear keep you away. And are, I hope you are having a great time in France. Okay, here's what I might say in this instance. C'est terrible ce qui s'est passé à Paris. J'espère que vous n'avez pas été touché. So what happened in Paris was terrible. I hope you were not affected. Or you could say something a little bit more convoluted, uh, well, a little bit more French too. C'est affligeant ces attentats à Paris. I am saddened by the terror attacks in Paris. And by the way, don't feel like you have to say something, but if you want to say something, the simplest thing you could say is, c'est triste ce qui s'est passé à Paris. What happened in Paris was very sad, and everybody will understand what you want to convey. I've been told by a friend who lives in Strasbourg that the safety measures this year are much more elaborate than they have ever been, and I hope it keeps everybody safe. I have every reason to believe that it will, so have a wonderful vacation. If Join Us in France makes your life happier and your trip planning easier, let us know by joining the mailing list, subscribing to the podcast, reviewing the show on iTunes, sharing status updates on Facebook, or sending in a donation. Merci beaucoup.